Good morning, I'm Russ Cooper and I'll be your reader today. Please join with me as we read Psalm 125 responsively. Those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. They will not be defeated, but will endure forever. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. The wicked will not rule the land of the godly, for then the godly might be tempted to do wrong. O Lord, do good to those who are good, whose hearts are in tune with you. But banish those who turn to crooked ways, O Lord. Take them away with those who do evil. May Israel have peace. Father in heaven, use this time of worship to focus and strengthen our faith in you so that it will lead us to serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin our worship today by lighting this candle to remind us that Christ is present among us as we worship. And we worship in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us, and we all know from our own lives, that the world doesn't work the way it is supposed to. It is broken. And this brokenness affects our relationships with God and each other. Unfortunately, we're unable to fix what is broken because we ourselves are broken. We call this brokenness sin. And as the Bible says, if we claim that we are free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, God will forgive us. Once forgiven, our relationship with God is repaired and the basis for repairing our relationships with each other is established. Let us spend a few moments together now and confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Father in heaven, we are broken and need your help. We ask you to forgive whatever sins we have committed. Guide us so that your forgiveness overcomes our broken lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is merciful, and so I say to you this day that your sins have been forgiven. To make sure that you know your sins are forgiven, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for you. So let go of the burdens that weigh you down and give them to Jesus and celebrate this new opportunity that God has given you. Amen.
Lord God, so many people of great faith have come before us, shaping the world around them. Use us to shape the world here and now so that your people will be a light shining in the darkest corner of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 7. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people of the earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations, for you were smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you, and he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love and obey his commands. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all, wouldn't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ our Lord. I'm going to read that last sentence again. Number 39. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God. Word of life. If you buy a book about the Psalms or you go on the internet and start doing some research about the Psalms, one of the things you're going to come across is um, this idea that there are different kinds of Psalms. Psalms of lament, wisdom Psalms, royal Psalms, Psalms of thanksgiving, Psalms of worship, Psalms of faith, didactic Psalms, all these different ones. And you may even come across a list that says this Psalm is this kind. You know, let's say one of the normal examples, a common example is Psalm 13 is a psalm of lament, and Psalm 93 is a royal psalm. But we need to remember that many of the psalms, um, they're not just songs about one thing. They're often a person's expressions about their emotions of life, about their joys and their struggles. Um, you rarely find one psalm that's only happy or only sad. Just like in life, we are rarely only happy or sad. Life is rarely just a triumph or a tragedy. Life is all these things mixed up. And Psalm 25, which I'm going to be preaching on today, is a really good example of what this can look like. Psalm 25 encapsulates many of the struggles of life. So we'll read it first and then we'll dig into how that works. So, O Lord, I give my life to you. 
I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be discouraged or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness for all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. Feel my pain and see my trouble. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me. Rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you I take refuge. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. O God, ransom Israel from all its troubles. What we see in Psalm 25 are the complications of life. We wish life were simple. We wish we could break it down like this, that thing, person is an enemy or a friend, it's good or bad, you're building up or tearing down, healthy or unhealthy, safe or dangerous, triumph or tragedy, happy or sad, joy or lament. If life were only that simple, if only it were clear and the good guys always wore white hats and the bad guys always wore black hats. We know that's not true. We, we, in, a, in, a, in a complicated world, we want to, and it is our human nature, to try and distill it all down to, is it good or bad? Am I happy or sad? Is this a time for joy or a time for a lament? Is this healthy or unhealthy? That's what we want it to be. That's what we crave, but it's a complicated world. These days, it's an especially complicated world. So the author of Psalm 25 looks at all of these things in life, joys and sorrows, hope and the loss of hope, and they wrote this psalm about it. Uh, it is an acrostic poem in the original Hebrew that it was written in, uh, an acrostic poem is a poem that takes a word or a phrase or the alphabet, and each line begins with another letter. Uh, in case you don't remember going back to your, your grade school unit on poetry, here's a, a real simple example. It's written by a poet named Theodora Onkin. Super bright, ultra light, never night, mostly seen on days in between, only the new, and not often blue, shining in the sky, twinkling bright in the eye, always glowing like a firefly, radiant splendor from high, shining sparkles never die. So I have a first letter underlined there. If you look at that, you see it spells sun, moon, and stars. That's an acrostic poem. It's something we probably all had to do at some point in grade school, something writing a poem about happy or something that makes you, uh, something you enjoy. Now, Psalm 25 is that, only it's, it's a learning device that someone wrote uh, that each line starts with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It would be like if we wrote a poem, there's line A, line B, line C, and the first word would start with that. 
Uh, but it's more than that. It's more than just a simple teaching device. It's not like that last poem we saw, which uh, is just kind of a fun little thing about sun, moon, and stars. Psalm 25 engages with the struggles of life. It comes out of the author's struggles with the complications of life. And we're going to see some recurring themes throughout Psalm 25. We're going to see God's guidance in time of troubles and deliverance from those struggles. We'll see trust in God and petitions for guidance based on that trust. We see forgiveness, God's goodness and faithfulness, instructions on the benefits of fearing God, God's future deliverance and protection, and finally, a prayer for a nation. All of these things are, are things that touch on the struggles the author has. Now, who the author is, is a bit of a mystery. It's, it's listed in the Bible as a psalm of David. But of can mean that it was by David, or someone wrote it for David, or someone dedicated it to David. We don't know. It's associated with David. He may have written it. And if as we're going through it, and you know the life of David, if, if reflecting on the life of David helps give some context to these struggles, that's great because it's, it's tied to David, whether he wrote it or it was dedicated to him or someone wrote it for him. Uh, it is connected. So that's a, that's a logical place that, to work, is to work within the life of David and the struggles that he had are well documented in the Bible. And we're going to see two themes that run throughout this, uh, this, this psalm. They are God as teacher and the author as student, and the image of following God on a road or a path. So, jump right in, and we begin with verse, the opening. It says, O Lord, I give my life to you. Uh, in the Bible, whenever you see Lord, all caps like that, uh, it means Yahweh. This is God's name. We first come across it in Genesis chapter 2, where it says, When the Lord, Yahweh, God, Elohim, made the earth and the heavens. In Exodus chapter 3, at the burning bush, God reveals to Moses that this is God's name. Moses says, Who should I say is sending me? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am, Yahweh, has sent me to you. And just a reminder, I touch on this often when dealing with the Bible. When it talks about the, the life or the soul in the Hebrew context, it always means all of me, mind, body, and soul. Not just who I am, but what I do and why I do it. So that's the opening of our psalm here. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. Here, God is that word we encountered last time, Elohim. This is a title for God. It's not a name. You wouldn't, if you ran into God at the supermarket, you would say, hello, Yahweh. You wouldn't say, hello, Elohim, uh, because it is his title. And disgraced, the Hebrew word is bosh, and it can represent the results of mistrust or mistrusted, misplaced trust. That's what it is. So we see in Isaiah, Isaiah says to the people, or God says through Isaiah, you will be ashamed of your idol worship. And later in Isaiah, then the Philistines will be thrown into panic. Same word here. For they counted on the power of Ethiopia and boasted in their allies in Egypt. They've had misplaced trust. And, and we'll just say David here, because it's the Psalm of David, even if you wrote it or not. David is saying, don't let me be disgraced. Don't let me be thrown into a panic. Don't let me be ashamed. Because I've not misplaced my trust in you, God. I don't believe I've misplaced my trust. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Someone who has acted... Um, treacherously, or they have betrayed another. They are faithless. This is the opposite of righteous. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. 
for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. We're gonna sev- we, we encounter several words here that have to do with learning. It's show, point out, lead. This person is asking God for instructions because that's what God does. He instructs us. He leads us. They just reminded God of that in the opening. God, this is what you do. Now, show me, point out to me, lead me. And this idea of the way, show me the way. We think of now uh, in John 14 at the Last Supper where Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus is using language that the people around him already know. They already they have context, they have a framework for understanding what is the way of God. Well, we know that it's all over the Psalms. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. This is a fundamental concept in the Bible and a foundational concept for Christianity. That our forgiveness is not based on us deserving it or anything we've done. Our forgiveness is solely based on God. On God's goodness. On God's mercy. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness for all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. So what we have here is, the, the, we'll say David again. David has appealed to God for guidance and for forgiveness, and he's praised God's character. He trusts that God is good and faithful in being a guide. And he teaches the sinner and the humble. Those are the two, uh, the two criteria for being forgiven is you have to be a sinner and you have to be humble. If you're not a sinner, there's nothing to forgive, but we all under, fall under that category. But you have to be humble because you have to be willing to say, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. So this goes on, and we have this unfailing love and faithfulness. The, the, the word Hebrew words there are kased and imeth, unfailing love and faithfulness. These are central traits of God's nature and existence. God would not be God without them. You can't have, if, you, if you have God and you take away unfailing love and faithfulness, you don't have God anymore. And, and if people want to talk about God, that's where they have to start because they are central to God's very existence. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Here they're appealing to God for forgiveness, again, not because they are worthy, but because God is true to God. We see it in Romans chapter 3. True, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. And also when Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. The, the Hebrew word for fear means to be in, in awe of someone or something, to show humility before them, to be overwhelmed when confronted by a person or a task. So the fear of the Lord then is to be in awe of God, but this awe is always tempered by trust. And the trust leads to obedience. Uh, in another place in the Bible, it uses this word for fear about someone afraid to go into battle. There's just fear. 
They're just overwhelmed by the thought of going into battle. That fear is not tempered by trust and obedience. That's why we have to hold on to this understanding of the nature of God as being merciful and having unfailing love. Otherwise, we're left with just the fear. They will live in prosperity. That's who follow the way of the Lord. And their children will inherit the land. Those who fear the Lord, to, to put another analogy in place, those who fear the Lord are protected like a house protects a person sleeping at night. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. The Lord is a friend. The noun is sad, um, and it's used for counsel or a close trusted relationship. So what David is saying is here is the idea is that those who have the Lord as a friend have the benefit of God's counsel, of God's instructions. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. My eyes are always on Yahweh. Remember, it's Lord in all caps. That's the name, Yahweh. It's God's name. My eyes are always on Yahweh. Although there is fear and awe present here, they're keeping their eyes on God because it is God who rescues them from their enemies. Just as a person asks for forgiveness because of God's goodness and not their deserving it, they keep an eye on God because it is God who can protect them and not themselves. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. Feel my pain and see my trouble. Forgive all my sins. See how my enemies, see how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me. Rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you I take refuge. David's making one last appeal here for help because he needs protection from them. I am alone. He feels like he has been deserted. And his only friend that he has left is his trusted God and teacher and friend. Feel my pain. The Hebrew word here means to consider or to look upon. That, that, that God should look at David's pain and have sympathy and empathy for David. It's interesting that here he asked God to rescue him from his enemies through forgiveness, not punishment of the enemies. The Hebrew word nasa, forgive, it relates to lifting a burden or lifting a person up. As God lifts David up, the weight of the guilt of his sin is removed. And he can stand confident. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. If you want some interesting reading on these words about integrity and honesty and how messy life can be, read the book of Job which opens, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. And then everything goes wrong for Job. And then we have our ending. Our last line, O God, ransom Israel from all its troubles, is not part of the acrostic pattern. It's put on as, as an ending, as, as a closing remark. So the person here, David, with this psalm, sees his own struggles as a microcosm of the struggles of the kingdom of Israel. And just as he wants God to deliver him, he's asking God to deliver Israel. Ransom, 
It means to buy something back. It's used in the context of ransoming or delivering a person from trouble or affliction. We use it today in the case of a kidnapping. You pay a ransom to get the person back. Just as God redeemed Israel from the slavery of Egypt, and he redeems individuals from their enemies, now David, in pouring out his soul in Psalm 25, is saying to God, I am alone, I need redeeming. Some of the redeeming I need is because of my own sins of my youth. Some of my redeeming I need is, is because I followed the wrong path at times. Some of the redeeming I need is because there are people out there who are my enemies who are trying to, to knock me off of the path you've set before me. And so David sees in his own life these struggles, the messiness of life. And he pours it out in this psalm. And he's saying to anyone else who reads it at the time he lived in Israel, see, I have these struggles and we have these struggles. But here is the one who can redeem us. Here is the one who has the way for us. Let us pray. Lord God, when we read this psalm, we pray that we pray that it will see it, we will see in it the difficulties of life, and it will reflect reality for us, that we too are in need of redemption. Sometimes that need is our own doing, sometimes it is the pressures of the world pushing down on us. And we pray that through the forgiveness of sins, you would lift us up and place us back as your people to follow your path. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for being our Savior, Lord. Thank you for coming to earth to die a sinner's death so that we can look forward to the gift of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for our church family here at Word of Life. Continue to keep our fellowship with one another strong and positive. Use this church as an instrument to reach out to meet the needs of a hurting world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the United States of America and for our elected leaders. We pray for those who serve to keep others safe through law enforcement and military service. We especially pray for those that we know. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling with illness in mind, body, or emotions, and we humbly ask that you touch them with your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us safe this coming week and use our lives in the service of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In my sermon today, I talked about this idea that God is a friend and a trustworthy friend who will not steer us wrong, will show us the right way to go, and will protect us. So I was thinking about that. I was thinking about two examples from my own life about friendship and what real friendship looks like. And I was thinking about when I was young, 
Um, I was in maybe about fifth grade. I was at a friend's house or someone I thought was a friend, and we're playing a game. It was me and him and another guy. And I found out uh, they were cheating, so I would always lose. And when I got mad, they just laughed at me. And I'm sorry to say that kind of led to the end of our friendship, that I realized this person was someone I couldn't trust. Um, and, and we just drifted away because I didn't want to sort of invest myself or spend time with someone I couldn't trust, someone who would make fun of me uh, to get a laugh for other people. And then I was thinking about another friend of mine. I have a picture here. Uh, this is a picture with me and my friend Tony. We were in the army together, and Tony was somebody that, you know what? He didn't make fun of me, and he didn't uh, do things to embarrass me in front of others. Tony was always looking out for what was best for me, and he was a little older than me, and I wasn't married then. I was single and in my 20s, and, and he would have me over uh, for supper with his family. He had a big family, seven kids. Um, some of them a little young, most, they were all a little bit younger than me, but he would have me over for dinner. Uh, if it was a holiday, he would have me over and, and he always was there supporting me and helping me. And, uh, even after I moved away, we stayed in contact and he always wanted to know about, you know, the good things in my life that he could help celebrate. So, just wanted to think about that and how we have this idea of God as a friend and that in turn, God wants us to be a true and trustworthy friend for each other. So that's what in these times when it's hard to go out and we're not sure what's going to happen with a lot of stuff, that's a good thing we can do though. We can work on being a good and trustworthy friend for other people, just like God is a good and trustworthy friend for us. Thank you. Please join with me in the closing prayer. Lord, we pray that our time here will bless and guide us in the week to come. Plant your word deep in our hearts so that it will be a path before us, leading us to walk in your way so that we are a blessing to those around us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to say, He is mighty to say forever. Salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Give my life to follow everything I believe.
to say, He is mighty to say, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.